What is God trying to teach us through supernatural events? It's an important question for us to ask ourselves as we continue our way through the book of Exodus, right? How do we respond to the miraculous? What do we take away from these monumental movements of God? As we continue into the book of Exodus, this is really something we have to consider. We have the 10 plagues coming up, a sea being parted, a pillar of fire in the sky, water from a rock, and manna coming from heaven. All of these are major events in the Exodus narrative, and while we may not be experiencing these events, we do need to process them. Right? What is God showing his people through these events? And what is he teaching us through them today? In our increasingly scientific and secular world, there's been a bit of a trend to dispel the supernatural that we see in the Bible or to find natural causes for supernatural events. When we look at the 10 plagues, the sudden change in water color might be not that it was turned to blood, but that there was red clay sediment washed due to flooding upstream or, or a red algae bloom. And either of these might have caused uh, issues for the fish which passed away and for the frogs that fled the river. Right? That would, the plagues, this toxic algae or change would move them there, and this would cause frogs, and from the frogs we'd get the bugs, and the bugs would bring disease, and the disease would bring insects, and the pestilence that caused so many of the livestock, and the boils on the Egyptian people, and a localized volcanic eruption could have caused the change that led to these massive storms, and to darkness that blotted out the sun. But whether we look at these events and we go, okay, this is God ordaining nature at work, or we look at this and we go, God is directly at work in these supernatural events, or it's some combination of something in between, we see and we recognize that God is personally at work in these events. And he is teaching his people something about himself through them. So we're going to take a couple minutes together this morning. We're going to go through the plagues so that we're all on the same page for the events that occur, and then we're going to come back through them. We're going to analyze how do we see God working and who do we see God proving himself to be through this story? We'll spend the majority of our time this morning in the book of Exodus. So you're welcome to turn there in your Bibles or your Bible app. They're also going to be on screen behind me. And Exodus is the second book of the Bible. So if you have a hard copy, it's going to be towards the front of the book. The small numbers are going to be the verse numbers. Large numbers are the chapter numbers. And we're going to be in Exodus chapter 7. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. And your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of his country. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions, my people, the Israelites. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, perform a miracle, then say to Aaron, take your staff and throw it down before Pharaoh and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of Pharaoh and his officials and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same thing by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and it became a snake, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Yet Pharaoh's heart became hard, and he would not listen to them, just as the Lord had said. This narrative, this first verbal sparring between Moses and the Pharaoh, really sets the pattern sets the scene for what will happen continuing through the rest of the plagues, right? God commissions Moses to go and sends Aaron with him to go before Pharaoh and ask for his people to be let go. God will demonstrate his power to the Pharaoh and Pharaoh will resist the obvious conclusion that he is no match for the God of Israel. That he should concede victory to Yahweh, but he does not. He will not let the people go and there will be disastrous results from that. And this story will continue and it will repeat and it will escalate over the course of the nine plagues that we're talking about today. That's right, the nine plagues. Now, if you're concerned about that, you should really be more concerned when Joel preaches the nine commandments in a few weeks. But we're actually talking about nine plagues for two reasons. Number one, that's what Dave told me to do. But number two, the final plague really stands apart from these other plagues. Plagues 1 through 9 are a prelude to the deliverance that comes through the 10th plague. 
Right, the 10th plague sits in a wider context in Exodus 11 and 12 with lots of other things dealing with the Passover and dealing with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So today we're gonna journey through these nine plagues together and explore how we see God at work and how we see him redeeming his people through these disasters of biblical proportions. And next week, Dave's gonna lead us through the final plague and through Passover. We'll continue at, in Exodus 7, 15. It says, go to Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the river. Confront him on the bank of the Nile and take in your hand the staff that was changed into a snake. Then say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now you have not listened. This is what the Lord says. By this you will know I am the Lord. With the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water of the Nile and it will be changed into blood. The fish in the Nile will die and the river will stink and the Egyptians will not be able to drink its water. Water plays a very interesting role as we journey through the book of Exodus, right? Water is how Pharaoh attempted to eliminate the Israelite babies earlier on, but it's also how Moses was carried to safety. The plague on water here in Exodus chapter seven really begins the downfall of the Egyptians and it's finalized in water with the Red Sea narrative. And it tells us in Exodus 7.22 that the Egyptian magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. Right, so the Nile, the lifeblood of Egypt's prosperity and of their economy and an item of their worship has been turned to blood and the Egyptian magicians can do absolutely nothing to stop it. But Pharaoh, he doesn't let the people go. We continue Exodus 8.1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people, and into your ovens and your kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. Right, these frogs are not just in one or two spots or in a ditch along the side of the road. They are in bedrooms and kitchens and ovens. This is not opening a cupboard and a few little cute frogs pop out. This is an epidemic of endless frogs. Food preparation, difficult. Sanitization, meaningless. And as the frogs pass away, the smell of them, awful. But Exodus 8, 7 continues, the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. And so with the second plague, we see that Pharaoh begins to show signs of weakness. Even though his magicians are able to produce frogs on their own, he needs to ask Moses for help to dispel the ones that are there. But still, Pharaoh refuses to let the people go. We continue in Exodus 8, 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the ground. And throughout the land of Egypt, the dust will become gnats. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came on people and on animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. And thus far, the Egyptian magicians have been able to replicate these miracles, these supernatural events that have been occurring, but no longer can they do this. And they still can do nothing to come against them or to stop them or to prevent them. But Pharaoh, he still doesn't recognize the power of the God, and he still does not let the people go. We continue in Exodus 8.20, Then the Lord said to Moses, Get up early in the morning and confront Pharaoh as he goes to the river, and say to him, This is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you do not let my people go, I will send swarms of flies on you and your officials, on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies, even the ground will be covered with them. But on that day, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will make a distinction between my people and your people. The sign will occur tomorrow. And so we now have an explicit separation between the impact of the plague on the Egyptians and the impact of the plague on the Israelites. If this was purely a natural event, why would it not affect all people equally? But still, Pharaoh, after seeing this, does not recognize the authority of God, and he refuses to let the Israelites go. 
We continue in Exodus 9, 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go and can continue to hold back, the hand of the Lord will bring a terrible plague on your livestock in the field, on your horses, your donkeys, your camels, and on your cattle, your sheep and goats. But the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt, so that no animal belonging to the Israelites will die. So we again see this continued separation between the Egyptians and the Israelites, but still Pharaoh will not budge. He will not let the people go. We continue in Exodus 9, 8. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soup from your furnace and have Moses toss it in the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt and festering boils will break out on people and animals throughout the land. Verse 11 tells us that this plague of boils was on the Egyptians. Right, again, this continued separation from Israel and from Egypt. And we begin to see clearly that these plagues are escalating, right? We have the first plague, um, gnats affecting the land. We have the next plague after that, livestock, only affecting the Egyptian livestock. And now this plague, the sixth one, affecting the Egyptians themselves. But Pharaoh will not let the people go. Exodus 9, 13, we continue. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning, confront Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. Verse 22, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that hail will fall all over Egypt, on people and animals, on an everything growing in the fields. When Moses stretched out his staff towards the sky, the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed down to the ground. And so the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. And once again, Pharaoh is overwhelmed by this plague and he has to ask Moses and Aaron to come and to relieve it. But once they've relieved Egypt of this plague of hail, he changes his mind and he refuses to let the Israelites go. We continue in Exodus 10, 3. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your house and those of all your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land until now. Then Moses turned and left Pharaoh. And again, Pharaoh refuses to let the Israelites go. We continue with the ninth plague in Exodus 10, 21. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt, a darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky and total darkness covered all of Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days. Yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. And if you've been paying attention, you can probably guess by now, Pharaoh refuses to let the people go. This is the story of the nine plagues. Now, obviously, we're moving pretty quickly to get through all of this in our time today, but I'd encourage you, maybe take some time this week and sit down and read through all nine plagues in preparation for next week's message. It's fascinating to go through this larger chunk of scripture at once and see some of the things that are going. Just as you're doing that uh, this week, there's some cool things you can kind of look for. There's some cool literary elements that occur in this story. There's a chart that's going to pop up on screen. It's uh, borrowed from Peter Enns, who's a commentator, and he lays out a number of the literary patterns that show up in the plagues, right? Enns divides these plagues into three cycles of three that have a period of repetition in each of them. In each cycle, the plagues, the first two come with a warning, while the third one does not. In each cycle, the first confrontation occurs in the morning. The second one, the warning, we don't know the time. And the third one, no warning. The first three plagues all occur through Aaron's staff. The second cycle doesn't involve Moses or Aaron's staff. And finally, in the third cycle, all three plagues involve Moses' staff as the item causing the plague. Right, there's some cool literary design to show that these plagues have been put together. But now let's take a moment, let's go back through the plagues and let's see who is God showing himself to be through these, right? God is showing himself to be God over creation. 
as Moses comes in and he outwits the Egyptian wise men and the magicians and he demonstrates control over the elements and water turns to blood and frogs and bugs are generated from nowhere and diseases are commanded and there's massive storms, there's darkness, God is showing his mastery over his creation. This mastery over nature continues throughout the book of Exodus with the parting of the Red Sea and pillars of fire and cloud as we talked about, but this theme of God being above creation is not something that we only take away from the book of Exodus. Right, throughout the Bible, we have stories of God reigning over nature. There's the flood in Genesis. Joshua 10, 11 says, as they fled before Israel on the road from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the sword of the Israelites. Isaiah 28, 2 says, See, the Lord has one who is powerful and strong, like a hailstorm and a destructive wind, like a driving rain and a flooding downpour. He will throw it forcefully to the ground. Isaiah 30, 30 says, The Lord will cause people to hear his majestic voice and will make them see his arm coming down with raging anger and consuming fire, with cloudbursts, thunderstorms, and with hail. Ezekiel 38, 22 says, I will execute judgment on him with plague and with bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on him and his troops and on the many nations that are with him. And we read in Joshua 10 that the sun stands still in the sky for a full day as a battle rages on. And we read in 1 Kings 18 of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, where fire comes from heaven to ignite this water-saturated altar. In the plagues, we see that God is working his will through the Nile River, through frogs, through gnats, through flies, through disease, through livestock animals, through storms, through locusts, and through darkness. Right, throughout scripture, God repeatedly shows himself to not only be the creator of all things, but to be a master of his own creation, able to work it and to rework it by his will so that his name might be made great and that his people may prosper. The plagues continually point us towards this reality that God is over creation. It's also key to note that throughout this narrative of the plagues, God is separating out his people. Right? The plague of flies, of livestock, boils, hail and darkness, they don't affect God's chosen people. These events are more than just creation at work, right? If it was simply flies being flies or a disease being disease or whatever it is, why would it not affect a certain group if it was not God's hand at work. These are intentional and targeted movements of creation through the will of God. Through the plagues, God is demonstrating himself to the Pharaoh, to the Egyptians, and to his people, the Israelites, as God over creation. God is also showing himself to be God over the supernatural. Right, we see this through God's continuous rebuttal of the Egyptian wise men and through the barriers to worship that keep getting put in place. Right? This initial confrontation with Moses and Aaron at the beginning of chapter 7, Aaron's staff swallows up the staves of all the other wise men. After the Nile River has turned to blood, the magicians can replicate, but they can't rebuttal the plague. There's a phrase in Exodus 7.19, it says, Blood will be everywhere in Egypt, even in vessels of wood and stone, which some commentators believe references ceremonial vessels that would have been used in idol worship. So they can no longer worship through those vessels. Right, with frogs, the magicians can replicate them, but they can't dispel them. And as a quick aside, if you're Pharaoh, and these are your like, wise men, these are your like, best guys, and Moses comes and he turns the river to blood, and you're like, okay, I got this. Guys, come here. Everyone, come here. What are we going to do about this? And they're like, oh, we got this, Pharaoh. Here's some more blood. I'm like, okay, come on. That's not really what I wanted. And then a couple days later, you're going, and Moses has had these frogs come up everywhere. And there's frogs teeming over all of Egypt. And you call your wise men and your magicians. You're like, hey, these are the best guys we got, the best guys in Egypt. They're going to help us deal with this. They're going to deal with the frogs. Pharaoh's like, hey, guys, what do you got? And they're like, hey, Pharaoh, more frogs. Like, how frustrated are you? They read like the bad henchmen in a cheesy superhero show. In Exodus 9, 11, we read that the magicians, they can't even stand before Moses and Aaron when they're afflicted with boils. And cleanliness is a, is a pretty integral part of worship for many of the ancient Egyptian gods and goddesses. So this uncleanliness from the boils would not only prevent the magicians and the wise men from coming to confront Moses and Aaron, but it probably would actually prevent them from even being able to engage in worshiping their false gods. These counterfeit magicians, they can reproduce supernatural action, but quickly they are outmatched by Moses. 
And even when they're able to respond, they can only mimic what God is doing. They can never countermand it. Whatever supernatural power they may hold is no match for the God of the Israelites. Many commentators as well going through these passages have pointed out the parallels between the plagues and specific Egyptian gods. And it's fascinating to look through the plagues with this lens and to see how the plagues progressively show the dominance of Yahweh, the God of the Israelites, over the Egyptian pantheon. Now, I'm a big fan of mythology, especially Greek mythology, and the many stories of great heroes that have been retold throughout history. And I think we're really generally familiar with many of the Greek myths, right? Whether Disney's Hercules or Percy Jackson and the Olympians or movies like Troy or Clash of the Titans. And because we're all somewhat familiar with these stories, there's a bit of a general consensus about who's who in these Greek myths and, and what's going on in these stories. But Egyptian mythology doesn't really hold the same place in our cultural sphere. Aside from Moon Knight, I really struggled to find anything that contained Egyptian mythology. And so we don't have common cultural language in our sphere to talk through some of these things. Right, the ancient Egyptian religious belief system ran for a period of about 3,500 years. And over that time, there were a number of changes. Right? There was political movements where people that preferred one god to another would come into power, and that god was now the more powerful god. There was religious movements where things would change. There was times when gods were synthesized into one god, or they would share a name, or they would change their names. And you know, when we look at the old kingdom, older Egypt, there was a tomb, and they were like, a tomb's the best one, and Ra was second. And then later on, there was Anum, or Amun, and then later Amun and Ra became one. And so it's kind of tricky to keep track of who's who as we go through some of these stories. All of that to say that each of these plagues does show us that God is working against and superseding the various Egyptian gods and goddesses. But depending on what sources you're taking from or what other things you're familiar with, they might have different names or have different uh, attributes associated with them. But as we look at some of these things, like the water on the Nile being turned into blood, that would be an attack on the Nile, which was often considered a, a god or an object of worship in and of itself. Or Hopi, who was the god of the Nile. There was Kinum, who was the god of water and of life. And Osiris, who, according to certain myths, the Nile was his bloodstream. All of those are attacked when the Nile is afflicted with this plague. When frogs cover the land, this would be an attack on Heket, who was the patron god of childbirth and creation and was represented as a frog. When we have dust becoming gnats, that would be an attack on Geb, who was the god of the land, as in the god of the literal dirt, which is now being turned against Egypt. When we have flies swarming across the land, this would be an attack on all the various gods of the earth. When we have livestock being afflicted, that would be an attack on Apis, who is the god of fertility, represented by a bull, or Hathor, a goddess of the sky, represented as a cow, or Merwer, who is another livestock-related deity. When we have the plague of boils, that interrupted Egyptian worship as they were ritual impurities. When we have the plague of hail, for would affect Sudek, who was the god of wind and storms, and Newt, the goddess of the sky. The plague of locusts would be an attack on Serapis, who was the god of protection of the land, and Isis, the goddess of life, and Min, who was the harvest god and the protector of crops. And this plague of darkness would supersede Ra, who was the sun god, and Atum, who was the sun god, and Horus, who was the sky god, but also the sun god. Again, it gets a little confusing when they all change names. But at every point in this plague narrative, Yahweh is asserting himself as God over the supernatural. There is no other power. There is no priest of the Egyptian gods. There is no prayers that can be raised up. There is no territorial deities that can stand against the supernatural power of our God. God is showing himself to be God over all supernatural beings. There's a third thing that God is showing us through these plagues. God is showing us that he is a God who redeems his people. Right? Throughout the plagues and narratives, God separates his people out. Exodus 8.22 tells us, But on that day I will deal differently with the land of Goshen where my people live. The swarms of flies don't affect the Israelites. The impact on livestock does not affect the Israelites. The boils do not affect the Israelites. There is no hail in the area the Israelites inhabit. We can infer from Scripture that the plague of locusts does not impact the Israelites because they consumed what was left after the hail, which had not affected them. Even when there's darkness for three days, the Israelites are not affected. All of this separation is pointing us to a God who will separate his people. It points us toward Passover, where God will separate his people from the Egyptians. 
God deals differently with his people. He is redeeming them, and they do not face the afflictions of the Egyptians. Right? All of these plagues are pointing us towards a God who deals differently with his own people. This pattern continues through the book of Exodus as God leads his people out of Egypt. It continues as he's their provider in the wilderness, and as he stands with them to defeat their enemies as they come into the promised land. But this theme of a God who redeems is not limited to the book of Exodus. Or we know that our God is a God who redeems because of the work of Jesus. Jesus has come and his work on the cross has set us free. He has set us apart from the wages of our sin and the death that we should have to endure. And there are so many parallels between the Exodus narrative and the life of Jesus, right? Jesus' birth is announced with a star, God working through creation. Jesus' first miracle involves the transformation of water. Jesus speaks, and with a word, he can calm storms. Jesus walks on water, and he can multiply bread and fish, and he curses a tree to wither, and he has authority over plague and disease, and he can heal with a word. He is God over creation. Jesus speaks with authority against the temptation of Satan. He commands and casts out demons with supernatural authority, and ultimately, he defeats death. He is God over the supernatural. And Jesus is at work to redeem his people, to set them free from sin and from death, and to give people a new way to think, a new way to live, and a, a mission to share the gospel of redemption with the world. And when it comes to a passage like this, and we come to the end of a sermon like this, I, I always struggle. Because I really like having something really practical to do at the end of a message, right? What is, what is a practical change that I can make in my life based on what I've learned today? And I remember in my third year of Bible college, we had theology courses, and we had one where we had to debate theological issues. They kind of put us in groups, and they'd say, okay, here's your topic. Here's three or four acceptable positions within kind of the range of Christian belief. Go, argue them. Figure out what's right. Figure out who's who. Figure out what's going on. And, and I, I always felt like it was a waste of time. Right, because whether I believe Jesus is coming back earlier or later or somewhere in the middle of whatever's going on, what really matters in how I live my life is that I believe Jesus is coming back. Right? It doesn't matter how I, be how I believe God created the world. It, what matters is that I believe that God is the creator. And that's not to say theology isn't important, but I really value praxis. Right? How do we take what we know? How do we take what we believe? And how do we put it into action? How does that change how we live? And with this story, I find it's, it's really hard to do, right? There's no character that we identify with in this story. There's no actionable takeaway that we can take from the plagues. We're not bringing our livestock in to protect them from the hail. One commentator really puts this into perspective. He says, there is not likely a message in ascribing a plague story to our own lives, like the plagues in you. It seems to me that there is little literal contemporary significance in the nine plagues recounted in Exodus 7, 8 to 10, 29. We are not the Israelites and we are not oppressed by Egypt. We must resist the temptation to apply the plague narrative by ascribing to God's judgment any natural catastrophe or other similar disasters that happen along and fit them into our personal view of how God acts. The story of the plagues is not about what God does to save you, it's perhaps not even a story really so much about how God has saved Israel, but it is a story about God, period. For when all is said and done, we all need to be reminded of him now and then. The question then to ask of our passage is not, what does this have to do with me? It's what does this teach us about God? And I'll invite the worship team up as I close, but from the very beginning of this narrative of the plagues in Exodus, it has always been about God declaring himself to his people so that we might see who he is. Exodus 7, 17 says, this is what the Lord says, by this you will know that I am the Lord. Exodus 8, 10 says, so that you may know there is no one like the Lord our God. Exodus 9, 14 and 16 say, so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Exodus 10.2 says, Tell your children and your grandchildren how I dealt harshly with the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know I am the Lord. This story is written for us today so that we might know, that we might see, that we might recognize that God is Lord above all, that he is the Lord above creation 
that he is God and Lord above the supernatural and that he is the God who redeems his people. 3,500 years after these events, we are still reading them and we are still proclaiming the power and the authority of our God. And while it may not feel actionable in how we live, having a right view of God should always be our goal. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have shown yourself to be over creation, that you have shown yourself to be over all supernatural beings, and that you have shown yourself to be a God who loves us and redeems us. We thank you that we see this throughout scripture. We thank you that we see this throughout church history, and we thank you that we can see this in our lives today. Amen.